Well, is your average ugly high schooler enrolled in a magic academy with no magic just because of good old plot armor? Just as everyone is trying to win glory by becoming the most powerful mage, Will is in it to lose his V-card with his childhood friend. Everyone at the academy, including the professors, makes fun of him. However, Will continues to prove that sometimes a wand needs a sword. In the capital city, children with a knack for magic are prioritized in the best magic academy. But does it mean that no talents like our MC with zero affinity for magic have no chance? The answer is hell no cause of plot armor's interference. On the seventh dungeon floor will battle strong monsters with a sword to collect extracurriculum points. It would have been so much easier if it was a girl but men have to work for things. He wants to do whatever it takes to school the magic duchess in his class by playing match. In class, a student explains that channeling a tiny bit of magic into the bulk ore creates a chemical reaction. The sulfur produced from it can be used as a catalyst to conjure beautiful flames. Professor Edward compliments him for being right and wants someone to demonstrate the procedure. He picks Will despite knowing his balls have dried up of magic juices. However, he is dozing off in class, thinking who's going to be the next president of the United States. Edward calls out his name multiple times to wake him up. He asks the professor to repeat the explanation. But Edward can't give one fudge about him. He just wants him to come down on his knees and demonstrate the art of earning extra points. Edward's condescending claims is a simple process. He just needs to transfer a little bit of magic and the fire will be lit. Will applies his full concentration on the spell but can't produce any results. Moments later, the professor clicks his tongue, making the whole class laugh. He silences the class, expressing his disbelief that their institute allows a no-show like him to study magic. He believes that note-taking bookworms are only good for doing grunt work. He deems him entirely beyond help. At that moment, a fellow sixth-year student Cyan casts a basic fire spell to light up the torch. Edward reminds him that casting without permission is prohibited in their class. Cyan, the arrogant brat who thinks of himself as God, excuses himself for this behavior, saying his pal needed a light. Edward casts dark lighting magic to crystallize the flames. But more so, he intends to make a point. He reminds everyone that magic is more important than cup size. Magic is the supreme authority, giving esteemed status to those with innate talent. The rest can stay in the hallways and clean like a good little janitor. Later in the hallway, Cheyenne and his lackey, a normal cliche of every bully stop Will from crossing the road. They are about to drop nukes on his ass, but his knight in shining armor Colette comes between them. Cyan wants her to join the party and bully him. However, she walks up to him like a gangster, claiming Will is more kind than he can ever be. She tells him to stop bullying her friend, making his face go nuts. Cyan suggests bringing back her friend from Lola Land. He reminds them that Will can never be a Magia vendor. Colette feels bad for him having to experience Edward's class. However, he is glad that a cute girl like her is worrying about him. She freaks out at his flattery and claims it won't get him anywhere. But the way she's acting, I believe Will is going to get lucky tonight. He claims that a Jigachad taught him to compliment girls whenever the chance comes. She tells him to shut up before her fist flats his face. All of a sudden, Will silently watches the tower in the center of the city. Colette is worried about this sudden change and asks what has happened. Will says the sky is looking as beautiful as ever. They can't believe the five Magia Vanders hold up the sky on a daily basis. Long ago, beings known as celestial hosts threatened humanity's existence and filled the world with darkness. Five mages stood up in defiance to push back the threat. They created a barrier to lift up the sky. These five mages were given the highest honorary title for a mage known as Magia Vander. Every magician alive dreams of achieving this glory at least once in their life. Colette wonders if the Ice Maiden is currently watching them. He assures her that she's watching from the window. The year before, Will's childhood friend Elfaria told him about giant orbs called the Sun and Moon orbiting the real sky. But she was most intrigued by a sunset. At that time, both made a promise to become Manji Vanders and watch the sunset together. Elfaria took that little promise made on a whim seriously. With her talent, she became the youngest Magia Vander and climbed up the tower. However, his talents can't even be considered mediocre. But his determination to fulfill his promise is undying. After the break, Professor Worker shouts at Will, asking if he's gone nuts. He went to the dungeon without permission and fought on the seventh floor. Still, after reviewing the materials from the monster, Worker grants him two credits, lifting up his mood. The professor asks if he's still hell-bent on becoming Magia Vander. Will counters his question, asking if it's really as bad as people say. Worker gives it to him straight, explaining he needs to advance to the Upper Institute before aiming to become a Magia Vander. To graduate, you must have superior credits from written work, spell work, and practicals. Despite understanding the situation, Will insists on earning credits from practicals alone. Ultimately, Worker realizes that trying to reason with Will is like crying on deaf ears. 
He tells Will that he needs to gather four credits before the end of the week. Seconds later, he realizes that the week will end in two days. He sits down on his knees to look for a monster that is worth four credits. Worker thinks out loud, naming a monster worth four credits that Will hasn't defeated before. Unbeknownst to them, Shine hears about the monster and decides to kill the monster before Will can get to it. He will finally get rid of the boy who has tarnished the reputation of their academy. On the other hand, Will enters the sixth floor of the dungeon with Kiki by his side. The cat isn't sure about him fighting a Baskerville. However, he assures Kiki that he won't get burnt like the last time. In the meantime, Cheyenne and his two lackeys are focused on taking out the Baskerville to expel Will. One of them asks if they have protection in their pockets. Cheyenne reminds him that top geese like him don't need safety precautions. He plans to use his search spell to find the beast. Suddenly, a giant monster with insane speed appears in front of them, scaring the two lackeys away. Will overhears their scream and immediately follows the sound. Judging from the activation, he assumes they are not far. Upon reaching the scene, he finds a 10-credit evil sentient bullying a child. He doesn't know why the evil sentinel moved up several floors. He then glances at the human who ends up being Cyan. He constantly casts fire magic at the thing. However, Will knows that his measly attacks can't do shit against a high-level monster. As the monster gets close to Cyan, it dawns on him that Cyan might die. Will realizes he needs to step up and save him. At that moment, he remembers all the times Cyan and his friend bullied him. He asks himself if it's really necessary to save a scumbag like him. Seconds later, he remembers that Elferia called him the kindest person in the world. He wants to be someone worthy who can stand beside her. Despite being a no-talent in magic, he wants to be her sword. Will steps onto the battlefield and saves Cyan's ass from getting squashed. He pushes back the monster's feet away from Cyan. Using his muscle strength, Will goes on the offensive and strikes its shell. The impact from the strike destroys the ground underneath them. Back on the surface, Edward rushes to Worker's office in the middle of the night. No, he's not a fan of BL Manga. He reveals that Cheyenne and his piece of work council of dushbags went into the dungeon without authorization. He stands up in disbelief that an elite student can pull such a stunt. Edward reveals they are on the sixth floor and asks Workner to send his familiar inside. Upon hearing this, he calms down, telling Edward there is no need to panic. He activates his spying orb, revealing that Will is on the same floor as them. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, the impact from Will's sword and the monster's fangs clashing destroy the sixth floor. He spins around the monster to create momentum and cut down its horn. The monster anger pushes him away. Utilizing the distance, the monster throws rocks at him from the destroyed floors. However, Will slices through the stones before it even hits the ground. He then sneaks attacks from above landing a fatal blow. Cheyenne is watching this battle from the front row seat but still can't believe it. He wonders if he is the same Will Surfort from before. Even Edward can't believe his eyes. That is when Worker states that Will is totally different from them. As the battle continues, Worker explains that Will possesses the robust body of a dwarf. His observation skills can read enemy patterns after seeing them once. He demonstrates this move by countering an attack that the monster used before. He heavily damages the monster making it furious. Worker claims that in a world full of wands, Will is a lone sword. As the monster unleashes its fire breath, he reveals his true power. Will cuts through the magic attack with his special sword. The slash of his sword is like a bolt of lightning, defeating his enemies in an instant. When the smoke clears up, he asks if Cheyenne is injured in any way. He lets out his frustration by biting on his tongue and making it bleed. On the other hand, Edward slams the table with full force. He refuses to believe that a boy with no magic can somehow transcend it. Worker tries to stop him, but his efforts are fruitless. Upon returning to the surface, Will gets scolded by Professor before getting the 10 credits from defeating the monster. Five years earlier, Will seemed like your average man who can't get any action. The background NPCs gossiped about Will's lack of magic power. Some think it was just a rumor. But the majority knows the fact to be true. He is just a bait to lure Elferia to join the Academy. However, they think he should be expelled since she climbed the tower and became the youngest Magiavander. He walks to the principal's office with a sad look, telling everyone that it is his last day in the school. Professor Worker stands in the room as a mediator between Will and Cauldron, the principal. She waves her wand and hands him a sword made of special metal that can cut through magic. Unexpectedly, a new Will wakes up in him as he cuts through all the magic circles cast by Cauldron. Worker is so taken aback by his performance that his legs give out and his mouth is left open. In the meantime, Cauldron laughs at the unique thing they have in their hands. She decides to allow them to continue studying at the academy despite his shortcomings. Shocked, Worker repeats what she just said and asks if age is fudging up her mind. He reminds her that Will can't use any magic like Zero. She claims her eyes are not done yet. In fact, she has never heard of anything before. 
Will interrupts their conversation to shower them with questions. He asks if ascending the tower will be possible if he studies at the academy. With a quavering voice, he asks if becoming strong can help him join Elfaria at the top of the tower. Cauldron explains that his dreams will come true but only if he is diligent and firm against daunting experiences. Only then he can reach the top of the tower. He tightly holds the sword, taking Cauldron words to heat. After he leaves, she asks Workner to keep a close eye on him like a godfather. She is eager to see his sword's journey to becoming a wand. Back in the present, Will sniffs on chocolate in Willie Workner's class. The lecture today is about ascending the tower, which means attending the upper academy. Only those can become Magiovanders, the topmost honor a mage can achieve at the top of the tower Mercedes Collis. There are only two ways a mage can obtain this rank. First, they must create a new type of magic not known by humanity. Second, they must earn 72,000 credit points. Worker reveals that the majority of mages ascend with the first option, while there are only a minority that can earn 70,000 credits. At this point, his class has no chance of graduating. Ascending the tower is a far-fetched dream. And so he will drill them in his supplementary class, making everyone sob. After classes, Will is like his soul will slip away from the mortal realm without any warning. Colette can't believe Workner whacked them into taking supplementary. He informs her that Workner made them take full mock exams and instructed them on exams. She reminds him that his writing credits are at its max. But Will is falling behind because of no talent in spell work. However, failing in one subject doesn't mean he should not study it. Moments later, they find Cyan and his lackeys talking about him defeating an evil sentinel. He explains the whole scene from start to finish. The mob thinks that Cheyenne standing in the academy will reach the top three most talented students. However, he knows that everything is just a scam. It's like taking pics of a studio and saying it's a private jet. To add fire to his fuel, he sees Will and Colette pass by him. He makes his way through the mob, grabbing his collar. He wants to know how a talentless brat like him does something like that. Before his sentence can finish, Colette intervenes, forcing him to stop bullying the weak. On the other hand, Edward enters the principal's office to request Will's expulsion from the academy. She does not understand his reasons to expel him when he successfully reached his sixth and final year. Why should she knock him off this far in the game? As he puts it, the academy doesn't need a warrior who's not a mage. Plus, he can somehow surpass magic without using it. She opens Will's previous performance record, sharing his unrivaled written scores with Edward. She also believes that his research sheds light on a unique perspective. He excels to such a degree that calling it mere excellence is insulting. There are many paths open for him in the future. The Academy has the responsibility of producing learned scholars for that fateful day. Edward reminds him that Will won't settle for some run-in-the-mill scholar position. He wants to become a Magiovander. On that note, she allows him to test Will to his heart's content. The contents and extremism of the test is up for him to decide. As he leaves, she thinks to herself that Edward knows Magiovander's best. At the same time, Will hides his sword with Colette's help. She comments on him never changing a bit. He takes the insult as a compliment, of course. Plus, the officials won't let them carry a sword on campus, and his roommate Rusty won't let him out without some nuts. Later in the library, they won't diligently study about the Battle of Garzaronso from the Magic Year 344. The dwarves were a race from another world who were pissed because of exploitation, overwork, and worse treatment than the elves. The dwarves' army was 10,000 in comparison, the tower only sent one mage. Colette wonders why Will is studying so hard when his written exams credits are perfect. He wants to revise everything to ensure no credit is lost. More so, Will understands what the dwarves felt. The statement never give up gives him determination that can surpass magic. She immediately realizes that this sob line is from Workner. He kept trying to make his tool up and running and still is in the trying phase. As they have fun in the library, Edward invaded their privacy, telling them to book a room. Nonsense aside, he asks Will to come to the spell training room alone. She didn't know Edward had that type of fetishes. On his way to the hall, Edward reminds him that he's flunking spell class. He will give him a personal lesson, a supplementary only for himself. The two stand face to face with silence in the air. Edward casts his dark lightning spell, destroying an area near his foot. He says that Will's assignment is to land a single hit on him. He will gain five spell work credit for completing his task, otherwise will be expelled, leaving him shocked. During this time, Worker knocks on the principal's door, answering her summons. After entering, he finds a giant orb playing Will's and Edward's match on live. She explains that Edward is conducting a test. Just as she valued his plea for Will to continue studying, she must consider Edward's worry for Will pursuing a delusion. Worker doesn't have a problem with the test, but the person taking the test. Cauldron forces him to speak his mind. He reveals that Edward is the closest thing to a Magiavander. Sure, he lost before becoming one, but that doesn't mean he isn't an ascendant. 
Back in the spell hall, Edward casts a low-level dark magic spell. However, Will is unable to comprehend this spell's outlandish power. He leaps in from the side, using his superior speed to land a flying kick. Unfortunately, Edward has casted a shield on himself. He claims that trying to break a magic shield with his leg is laughable. He sends him flying with a simple spell. Will can barely open his eyes at this moment. Edward's casting speed is so fast that he can counter his attack. Plus, the last attack was fatal, making him cough up blood. As he tries to gather himself, Edward declares he is going to use two spells. His flames burn him to ash and his shield to stop his laughable kicks. With that said, he casts a magical series overlapping a single casting circle multiple times. Will realizes he is going to attack with a barrage of dark flames. The attack hits him directly, pushing him back a few feet. He realizes that beating someone like Edward without his sword is impossible. Luckily, Colette is organizing her locker because there is nothing better to do. She wonders how the lesson is going. Naturally, she assumes that Edward is forcing Will to give him head or he might be fulfilling his spanking fetish. Suddenly, Kiki arrives on the scene injured due to the dark flames. He points at the sword locker, telling her that Will is dangerous. Meanwhile, Edward states that Maju Vander is the pinnacle of magic while his skills are not even mediocre. As he approaches Will's lifeless body, he reminds him about the Battle of Garzaranzo. He reveals that the dwarves rebelled with an army of 10,000. He asks Will how many mages were sent by the tower. He tries to get up and answer the question, but Edward steps on his head, saying there was only one mage. Despite this, Will doesn't lose hope of winning. He grabs his leg, forcing him to move. At this point, Edward is confused as to what noble reason Will holds in his heart that drives him. He tightly holds his heart and says he wants to stand whom he loves with all his heart. He will fulfill the promise made with Elfaria to watch the sunset. Shocked to death, he can't believe that Will is aiming to reach the pinnacle of magic just for some worldly love. But he can't give one shits about what Edward thinks. At that moment, Colette rushes to the scene and gives him the blade. Edward attacks with killing intent, but Will slices through the attack. He casts a barrage of spells. Instead of running away despite his hands and feet shaking, Will knows that passing through the flames is his only option of winning. During his run, Will explains there is more to the Battle of Garzaranzo than what people know. The legendary dwarf commander landed a hit on the mage, making him acknowledge. The sword did reach a wand even for one second. He uses the smoke from the attack to launch a powerful strike from Edward's blind overhead. His power is enough to break the shield and land a hit. Edward doesn't say a word except rewarding him with the five spell credits and leaves. On the other hand, Cauldron laughs her lungs out complimenting Will's power. Ten years ago on that day, Elferia was going to the Upper Institute. Will was following her like a loser. She turns to him, reminding him that he's the kindest person in the whole world. This is something that she will always know. With that said, she says goodbye and turns her back to him. Soon, Will's emotionally damaged brain catches up to the fact his V-card is going away. He promises never to give up trying to climb the tower. He will definitely stand beside her even if there is no magic potion left in his balls. His words tear through her heart, but Elferia keeps walking to hide her emotions from Will. But then, he says they will watch the sunset together, making her stop. Elferia didn't realize he would remember their childhood promise. She turns with tears in her eyes, promising to wait for him no matter how many years it takes. After he leaves, Professor Worker intends to say a few consolation words. However, he overhears him sobbing. Will makes a promise to himself, saying it's the last time when he will cry aloud with a miserable voice. In the present, Will, the no-talent, overachiever book learner, is a self-sustained student at the academy. He wakes up early to deliver newspapers in the local area. The citizens began liking him for his work ethic and polite attitude. They are eager to see him return to Janice's place for his part-time job. He quickly rushes to deliver the remaining newspaper and heads to the academy. On his way, Will stumbles on the stairs, dropping all the newspapers. However, he pulls a flash stunt to gather everything. He notices that Elferia, the Albus Vina, is on the front page for inventing a new magic. With this, she has invented 12 original spells, a feat no mage has ever achieved in history. Suddenly, Will reads a request made from the Upper Academy to collect ice cores from Frost Walkers. Unexpectedly, the client is Elferia herself, which gets his juices overflowing. He returns to his dorm to ask Rosti for some new magic gear. He excitedly tells him about the order Elferia made. She asks him about classes. But Will says there aren't any today. He will visit the fourth floor to collect ice cores from Frost Walkers. For that, he needs her top tools, which are custom made. After collecting his items, Will leaves for the dungeon. He reveals that the great ancestor, Queen Mage Mercedes, said everything came from the dungeons. She told the future generation to venture into the unknown with knowledge and wisdom. She wanted them to conquer the unknown along their path. According to her, everything is connected from top to bottom. On that note, Will makes his way onto the fourth floor. 
There he finds half of the academy who whack off every night on Elferia's pictures, firing off shots everywhere. He then notices Cheyenne blasting off Frost Walkers left and right. His lackeys butter him up as usual, claiming he's the best mage in town. However, Cheyenne knows his performance isn't enough to reach Will's level during his fight with the evil sentinel. Will senses his bloodlust overflowing like his juices, realizing there will be no monsters left in the area for him. He rushes deeper into the fourth floor to find powerful Frost Walkers. Unexpectedly, Will finds a low-level monster preying on a young girl. He quickly steps into battle mode and kills the ostrich with multiple sword slashes. The girl can't believe he just used a sword instead of magic. Iris introduces herself as the girl who often bites more than she can chew. On the other hand, Worker explains that creating your own spell is a great achievement. It is so great that the mage advances to the top of the tower without any further requirements. The entire class knows that this only sounds easy. However, inventing a new spell is not a joke. Rose wants to know about Worker's thoughts on the news this morning. He claims that creating 12 original spells made her the best mage in human history. She asks if Colette is jealous because Will is going to the dungeon for Alfaria. Worker scolds them for causing a commotion while the class is still in process. But she is still worried about Will's intentions for stepping into the dungeon. Back in the dungeon, she asks if he's the senior from the sixth year who can't use magic, making him the first of his time. Will finds it odd that someone like Iris would call him a senior. However, she wants to respect the person who just saved her life. She wants to help fulfill the Upper Academy's order and help them keep the sky from falling. Will reveals that Iris is not exaggerating her claims. The sky they are under is not real. It is just a barrier in the sky held by the power magic of the Magia Vanders. According to the lore, the world will be plunged into darkness once again when the sky falls. That is the day the calamity will be upon them. They are learning the order not because everyone admires the Magia Vanders, but because they want to help them keep the barrier running. On their way, Iris mentions that she has met with Elfaria once before. One day, she was surrounded by a horde of monsters ready to devour her. At that point, offering her body to them was the only option. But Elfaria saved her in the nick of time from getting eaten. Afterward, they talked about a lot of things like boys and the ways they try to get inside their tunnel. With that said, she dedicated her life to Elfaria. Upon hearing of the order, she got so excited and unintentionally ventured deep into the fourth floor. However, after looking around, she realizes that most of the students have already cleaned out the area. Even her search spell can't pick up anything in the area. At the same time, Will goes down onto his knees and starts observing the area. Iris, a magic user, can understand what he is doing. He claims that frost walkers leave ice shards when walking. Most of them are between 0.5 and 1 mile wide. However, this is double the size. This means that there is a colossal size of a head. Iris can understand how a non-magic shore can sniff out such details when her search spell isn't working. He explains that magic is great and all, but it is not absolute, especially in the dungeon. He can match magic users with knowledge, wisdom, and experience. Iris is shocked that experience can be a factor in survival. As these words are uttered from her mouth, a giant frost walker jumps out of the cave and attacks him. Will is forced to jump out of the way with Iris. The frost walker lets out a huge yawn, freezing the surrounding area. Iris knows that Frost Rex is an advanced subspecies of the Frost Walker lineage. It is a monster that is worth six credit points. At the same time, the monster attacks with its ice breath, freezing everything in its path. Will carries Iris out of the way and tells her to stay put in one place. She tells him not to act recklessly as the monster is too strong for him. Physical attacks don't work on the monster. This is the reason the monster is known as the Dwarf Killer. The only way to defeat it is to use long drainage magic, otherwise the monster will freeze him to death. Will tells her not to worry as he has defeated this monster many times. He leaps into attack, making the monster unleash his breath attack once again. However, Will masterfully slides underneath the monster to take advantage of his blind spot. Not knowing where he is, the monster launches a rapid fire attack at the cave ceiling, hoping he will get hit by the rubble. Iris is forced to save herself from the rubble and take shelter behind an ice wall. She sees Will taking advantage of the smoke and rubble to hide his movements. He masterfully runs behind the monster and launches the magic item at him. He then goes back and forth, wrapping it around the tightrope. The monster constantly unleashes breath attacks, but Will continues wrapping the wire around it. He knows that physical attacks don't work on him as the Frost Rex's only weakness is fire. And since explosives are also made of fire, this means that Will can defeat it with ease. He lights up the fire which travels around its body, enraging in flames. The moment the fire hits the explosives, it causes the monster to burn to ashes, giving him a flawless victory. Afterward, the wires from Rorty's magic tool retract automatically, making it a magic tool with creativity. 
Iris is shocked by his performance on the battlefield and wonders what it would be like in bed. She goes all dark and bitchy when assessing his powers. As it turns out, the no talent is something else entirely. There's a big difference between the rumors and reality. But reporting this find is the real problem. Suddenly, Will tells her about finding the core which completes their mission on the fourth floor. On top of the tower, Iris walks in the hallway assessing his talents with more detail. She realizes that Will makes up for the lack of magic power with creativity and ingenuity. Not to mention, his battle sense is something that can only be obtained by tremendous experience. She opens her hair and concludes that Will is indeed not a mage but a very talented warrior. Before entering the main room, she apologizes for intruding. Inside, she asks the Mangia Vanders for a moment of their time. She asks if her presence in the room is disturbing them. Carriot Wiseman takes on a condescending tone, claiming it's just the insignificant meeting that makes her skin crawl. They are usually busy with keeping the barrier from getting breached and the world from being destroyed. Seal claims that the celestial hosts outside the barrier are just watching them peacefully from the other side. He is worried that they don't have the numbers or strength to fight them head on. Eleanor mentions that they need more elite images for the fateful day. They can't allow the lore to become a reality. Zeo cuts to the chase, asking how things are on the Watcher's end. Did she find anyone worth spending their time on? She reveals that an interesting prospect came up in her search. He can't use magic, but is an impeccable warrior. Some of the Magia Vanders instantly refuse this idea, but Zeo will train anyone as long as they are good. In the end, they decide to wait until the upcoming Grand Magic Festival, hoping that the talented ones will rise up from the masses and leave the trash behind. The Regarden Magic Academy has conditions for qualifying for the Upper Institute. Normal candidates must obtain 7,000 out of the 12,000 total credit points in the Academy to advance. That is the one absolute condition of becoming a Magia Vander. In the training hall, students are required to defeat Stone Golem to get credits in spell work. Cheyenne casts his signature Flame Magic Crims Serb to annihilate the Golems. Colette uses the rubble from his attack in addition to Earth Magic Steer Viola to crush her enemies into nothingness. The teacher announces that both have passed the test. Cheyenne with 9,889 credits and Colette with 7,340 credit score. In the meantime, Will is busy dodging the golem's attack. Without his sword, he can't do shit against it. Still, he instinctively rushes in from its side and prepares to punch it in the guts. The other students on the sideline who love backseat driving ask what he is doing. They can't believe that a student from the Magical Academy was planning to throw a punch. They tell him to use his wands. These insults from the side distract Will, giving the golem a chance to sweep his bum away. This gives them even more chances to taunt him. These thugs describe the whole situation again, saying they expect nothing less from a book learner who is an eternal failure. After having a quick laugh, everyone directs their attention toward Lehanna Owenzos, one of the top three at the academy. She casts Sagius Leo, creating arrows from lightning. At the same time, the elf Wignol Linder casts Wind Magic. Lehanna's arrows pierce through the golem's armor, rendering his mobility useless. She then simultaneously casts another banger to destroy it. Meanwhile, Wignol's spell is on the elegant side. It creates a whirlwind, destroying its target mercilessly. Then comes the third member, Julius Reinberg, with over 10 credits, enters the competition with his ice magic. He silently casts his icy roses that take root in the golem's armor. Moments later, as the flower blooms beautifully, all of the golems are turned to ice. Unexpectedly, he also freezes the golems that were meant to test other candidates. At this point, Lehanna realizes that both Julius and Wignall have lost touch. He reminds her that the revel is drawing near and so losing their touch isn't an option. Julius walks up to them and declares his intent of war. He expects that the two of them will accept a gift from him before that. However, Wignall slices the rose into pieces with wind slashes. Things don't stop there as Lehanna takes out her anger by flashing it with lighting. Will realizes that these three will surely advance to the upper realm. However, his chances are close to none since his credit scores are a little over 5k. The three of them walk past him and Julius tells him to stay away from his path. That is when, one of the students claims that they will be scouted at the Grand Magic Festival. This makes him realize that it's at that time of the year already. In the cafeteria hall, Colette slams the food on the table, saying we must enter the Grand Magic Festival. She thinks that advancing on credits from writing and praxis alone will get him nowhere. Plus, the scouts at the Grand Magic Festival choose individuals for their talent and not credit score. Will agrees with her reasoning. However, he knows that everyone is trying to turn things around with this one shot. And so they are all out for blood. He explains that a number of competitions are held in the Grand Magic Festival. Not only that, high mages descend from the tower to hunt for new talents. Despite his hesitation, Colette thinks that this is his only chance to advance to the Upper Academy. She reminds me that there are major factions up there. 
The Lightning Lord's wand forged is fast, the Scared Elf's wand Elif Cannon. The Flame Emperor's wand Incendia Barham, the Ice Maiden's wand Albus Vina, and the Light Sovereign's wand Mysterious Noah. She claims that his life will be sorted if one of the five factions chooses him. This will also give him a chance to showcase his true powers and change people's opinions about him. He truly appreciates her worrying over him. However, he thinks that his participation in the Grand Magic Tournament would just make it a regular sports event. Plus, the things that happened three years ago still haunt him. Colette knows that the 50th Grand Magic Festival was named the worst of all time. Will says that getting over those memories has been hard for him. Later in the evening near the locker room, they find students practicing for the Grand Magic Festival. Colette emphasizes this point heavily, claiming scouts from other departments will also be picking students at the festival. He can vouch for other parts if the scouts from the tower don't choose him. However, Will already told her that it ain't happening. He can't use magic and that's that. On that note, she forgets about him ever joining the tournament and goes by her day. Moments later, she notices a barrier spell on the trap door. She can easily break the barrier by force. However, the bang will catch everyone's attention. Unexpectedly, Kiki uses her abilities to dismantle the barrier without a sound, revealing stairs that go down. They find an underground gambling operation held by backbenchers. Colette can't believe that they are running an operation where the teacher doesn't pay much attention. Unexpectedly, they find Cyan at the event watching quietly from above. He shouts at Will for invading his privacy. Suddenly, Colette comes between them, telling them to shut his trap. Now Will asks him about his purpose since he's not betting. His two lackeys speak up, saying Cheyenne would do nothing like that. It's completely not like he is worried about the spread between him and the top three. Plus, the thought of them ignoring him never crosses his mind even for once. At this point, Cheyenne tells them to shut up before they strip him naked in front of the chick. Colette teases him about being scared of letting the spotlight go beyond him. Cheyenne claims that his credit scores are almost comparable to the top three. He just lost a few credits on writing. Still, he has been working hard ever since that incident with Will. And so these magic skills are comparable to them. But he doesn't understand why the hell his lips are running and explaining himself to them. After finishing spell brewing class, everyone closes their books, wanting to escape from the jail. Will wakes up Kiki a leave. At the same time, Colette stops him and asks if he is free for the day. She wants to explore the dungeon with him. However, Will apologizes as he needs to complete his shift at Jinnah's tavern. Her tavern lies in the slump area where the exploited dwarves come daily to quaff their alcohol. The sounds of their laugh make Will work there every day. Jenna cooks a few meals and asks Will to serve them. The dwarves are pretty chill with Will at this point, especially Donna who gets hand-delivered newspapers from him every day. He pities Will for working hard every day. He reminds him that someone with his magical talent can't get any scholarships. Dona knows that the Grand Magic Festival is coming up. He tells Will that his situation will be much better if he's in that. At that point, Jenna tells him to quit chit-chatting and get back to work. She thinks that his buddy is working much harder than him. Unexpectedly, Rosti is filling in to help Will with the dinner rush. He accidentally bumps into her and apologizes for putting her through so much work. Although she thinks that working without magic is a fresh experience, it makes her understand how the people on the other side live. Moments later, Jaina asks him to bring a few other part-timers, just like Rosti. But the dwarves think that Will deserves a pay raise as he works twice as hard. Back in the washing area, Rosti mentions that Will receives a low wage from Gina. He can probably ask Professor Worker for a better job. He is sure that he will arrange something. Will knows he would be troubling him more than he already has is not his style. Still, there is more to it than pay. He loves working with the dwarves. Their incredible hard work earns his undying respect. A spoon falls from the Tower of Dishes, forcing me to duck down and pick it up. At that moment, Julius walks into the tavern with his lackeys. He immediately hates the vibes of the whole place. But his lackey claims that this is the only tavern open in town. At that moment, Will catches his eyes. He can't believe that the no talent works there. He laughs super hard that the no talent is fitting in with the smelly dwarves. Donna wants to pay him respect for the insults at Will, but the other dwarves stop him, knowing the consequences. Julius takes on a condescending tone while talking to Donan. He asks what that look in his eyes is. He doesn't shy away from reminding them that they are immigrants from another world. He tells him to remember his place. Unfortunately, Donan can't say anything because they have no rights. Moving on from that, he takes his seat like he owns the place. During this time, Will explains that the dwarves migrated to their world and the celestial hosts destroyed theirs. Julius continues talking in the same tone even when asking for food and drinks. However, Will ignores him and continues explaining that the dwarves are looked down upon unlike the elven nation. In their world, magic is the supreme authority. 
if a dwarf laid a hand on the elves, their status in this world would be diminished. He thinks that the beans are grown from the barren soil which the dwarves culminate with their wisdom. Their sweat is proof of their endless hard work in the harshest of conditions. He claims that these are not things to be made fun of, not even by one of the top three at the Magic Academy. Still, Julius doesn't listen to one thing. He laughs at no talents, clicking the dwarf's foot for some change. He places his foot on the table, saying he's calling them eyesores. He then kicks the plate of beans. It falls on his shirt, but Will refuses to flinch at the situation. His glare angers the two lackeys, making them get up from their seats to teach him a lesson. Unexpectedly, Will grabs them by the collar and slams them into the table. The impact causes the drinks to fall on Julius's face and hair. He has never been humiliated like this in a while. Julius casts his magic abilities, freezing everything with his ice magic. Will tries to dodge his attacks, but where he steps, the ice spikes catch him. Eventually, he is forced to break the ice with his bare foot. However, Julius pushes him back against the wall, freezing his limbs. Still, the look in his eyes doesn't change, which makes him change his mind. He decides that freezing him in a tavern is no fun. He wants to defeat him at the Grand Magic Festival and leave the Academy when he loses. Will accepts the challenge and says he will apologize to Donan after losing. Watch this next video on screen and subscribe to not miss next part.